This is Vern Venom Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. Two mighty necessities in the living of a vital human life are courage and faith. Heraclitus, the ancient philosopher, declared much knowledge of things divine escapes us through our want of faith. And Joseph Fort Newton wrote, Belief is a truth held in the mind, but faith is a fire in the heart. Helen Keller, the blind author and lecturer, wrote, Dark as my path may seem to others, I carry a magic light in my heart. Faith, the spiritual searchlight, illumines the way. Although sinister doubts lurk in the shadows, I walk unafraid toward the enchanted wood where the foliage is always green, where joy abides, where nightingales nest and sing, and where life and death are one in the presence of God. That is magnificent, and that can be yours, but only by faith. Frederick Douglass, famous freed slave from Civil War times, never forgot the night he gave his most pessimistic speech. It was in Boston. A packed house heard him lash out at the evils of slavery, then conclude hopelessly that the white people of America would never end the black man's bondage. The only answer he asserted gloomily was armed revolt by the slaves, which could only result in wholesale slaughter. But then a gaunt, shabbily dressed black woman arose. In her enormously deep voice, she roared, Frederick, is God dead? The startled Douglas, usually quick to retort to hecklers, was momentarily silenced, and the equally surprised audience was first to recover. An avalanche of applause swept away the despair which had enveloped the hall. If you not only know God is alive, but if you furthermore know God, then you are spiritually empowered to face any situation, no matter how discouraging it may seem to be, and face it in vital faith. The very troubles of your human life can mold and form your strength and your character. You don't become a great tennis player by only playing against easy opponents, but against tough ones. You can't become a great equestrian riding only tame and plodding horses. You don't get to be a great cook if your only utensil is a can opener. No, you have to try some difficult things. Einstein didn't become outstanding by mastering third grade long division. He tackled the hardest problems there were. Your difficulties are among your greatest allies. They can stimulate and strengthen you if you will only meet them with faith as a child of God and ever seeking the power of God for the living of your life. God has power for your life. God's spirit is in your mind to stimulate and inspire your thinking. And God loves you with a fatherly, lasting love, with an almost blinding affection, an incomprehensibly great love for you, and forgiveness and mercy, and newness of life beginning this moment, if in this moment you will have the faith to claim it. Time, perhaps for a grimsly terrible parable. A certain man there was, it was not particularly perceptive, but he did notice one morning that the picket fence in front of his house looked extremely dingy, gray, and weathered. So he asked his neighbor what he should do about it. And his neighbor told him he should go get some white paint. That afternoon, the man obediently went downtown, paid $5 for a big bucket of white paint, came home and waited. Nothing happened. Early next morning, he went out again, looked at the picket fence. It was still exceedingly dingy, gray, and weathered. Utterly disgusted, the man stormed back into his house, berating his neighbor under his breath and muttering angrily to himself, well, there was five dollars wasted. End of parable. But those with ears to hear may recognize the truth of it, that religion, like a bucket of paint, is useless unless you apply it, because you have to become active in your faith. Benjamin Disraeli once said, action may not always achieve happiness, but there is no happiness without action. In the New Testament of the Scriptures, you do not read a book titled, The Dreams of the Apostles, The Idle Daydreams of the Apostles, The Apostles Were the Followers of Jesus, the wishes of the apostles, no, it's titled the Acts of the Apostles, the Book of Acts, because real religion always acts. Faith becomes such a motivating force in your heart, your mind, and your life 
that you become a transformed person and in turn a tremendous source of transformation where you are in the world as you are. Day after day during his voyage to America, Christopher Columbus made the following determined entry in his diary. This day we sailed on. There are days when it requires all the courage a man or woman can muster to do just that, to sail on, to persist in your purposes, to keep going on one more day, but with faith in God, all things, literally all things, are possible. Great men and women possess great purposes. Admiral Robert Perry wrote, The determination to reach the North Pole had become so much a part of my being that, strange as it may seem, I long ago ceased to think of myself save as an instrument for the attainment of that end. That is genuine determination. And after reading of Admiral Perry's struggles to reach the North Pole, a certain boy wrote these words in his diary. I have decided to be the first man to reach the North Pole. Years later, this same boy became not only the first man to fly over the North Pole, but the first person to fly over the South Pole as well. His name, as we know, was Admiral Richard E. Byrd. What goal, what dream... What grand ideal do you have in your mind, in your life, in your soul? Seek first for the will and wisdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God, said Jesus. And all other things worthy will be added to you. God calls all of humankind to practice God-like love and forgiveness. Somebody objects, well, I just can't do that. That's why I said we have to practice it. To practice your belief really doesn't mean you're perfect at it any more than to practice basketball means you're going to hit the goal every time. But it does mean that you're trying, you're working on it. And the spirit of God within will assist you in that effort. There's a very real sense in which to practice your faith is like practicing a sport such as tennis. It means you're involved in working at it, but it doesn't mean you're perfect. Putting your religion into practice is like putting a junior high school band into practice. There will be mistakes and sour notes and blunders, to be sure, but at least you're doing it. And that is the important thing. So put your faith into practice. Literally, make it a part of your day-by-day -day life by giving your life to God and rejecting fear, living in faith. Fear is a reaction you have when you don't believe you're capable of dealing with some current or future situation or when you believe someone or something intends to do you harm. Science can do much to counter fear based on superstition, but only your unyielding faith in the goodness of God can finally obliterate fear from your human experience. In the early religions, people believed in many gods, unpredictable pranksters whose favor was believed to be won or lost based on the observance of various sacrifices and rituals. And many human misfortunes, including sickness, death, and bad weather, were believed to be the work of unpleased deities. Fear of angering some god caused early religiously immature people seriously to consider how the gods would respond to their acts. But through fear, people became careful, thoughtful, and even reverent. And in this way, human fear brought people to look beyond themselves for the causes of their experiences and the effects. And it is thus written that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom for those who sit in darkness. But once you have gone beyond that point in your life, it is faith in God. It is the obliteration of fear. Jesus said, fear not, be not anxious, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He called humankind to live in vital courage. History records that over 100 years ago, the world's greatest tightrope walker, Charles Blondine, announced that he would walk above the thundering Niagara Falls with only the assistance of a 40-pound balancing pole. Naturally, the news soon spread like wildfire. Special trains from Toronto and Buffalo were run to bring the crowds who wanted to see this man defy death and the law of gravity. At last, the big morning arrived, June 30th, in the year 1858, an 1,100-foot tight rope had been stretched from bank to bank, and I shall walk across it, Charles Blondine said proudly. Suddenly, the voices of the great crowd were hushed as he began his breathtaking adventure. 
They watched him place one foot after another, one foot after another, until finally he placed both feet on the bank at the other end, the American side of the falls, and above the noise of the mighty Niagara arose the cheers of thousands of onlookers. But Blondine waved his hands in thanks, and then, calming the crowd, he shouted, I don't want to go back to the other side by myself. I want to carry a full-grown man on my back. And who will volunteer? Understandably, not a single person volunteered. They all admitted that he could do it, but no one believed in him enough to risk his own life. Finally, in desperation, Blondine turned to his manager, a man named Henry Colcord. Do you believe that I could carry you across? I have no doubt about it at all, he replied. Then, asked Blondine, will you trust me? I will, replied his manager. Let's start, said Blondine. The 38-foot pole is balanced. The great rope tightens beneath their weight. Cold cord mounts Blondine's back, and the two men move along slowly but confidently. They reach the center. All is well, but as they near the Canadian side of the falls, they pause. For a gambler who has a bet that Blondine cannot make it has cut the guy line, and the rope begins to sway fearfully. Dismount, cries Blondine to Colcord. This he does, standing with one foot on the rope and his hands on Blondine's shoulders. Harry, said Blondine, you are now no longer Colcord. You are now Blondine. Be a part of me. If I sway, sway with me. Do not try to balance. We will both be dead if you do. Colcord climbs back on Blondine's back. The rope sways wildly. Blondine begins running. How he keeps his balance, no one can understand, but he does. He does it. With Colcord on his back, he steps at last onto Canadian soil, the nerve-wracking experience over, and the spectators go wild with excitement. That was a true story. It really happened. And it is a perfect picture of the nature of trust. Faith in God is the highest form of trust you as a human being can exercise. It is putting your heart and your soul into the hands of God. Put your whole trust in God, for he who comes to God he will in no wise cast out. And God loves you with a fatherly love. You can trust God perfectly as you have never trusted any human being on this earth. For God is ultimately trustworthy, and God loves you, and God forgives you, and God has new life for you. If you will only have the faith in this instant just to believe that, just to accept that, just to lay hold of that, to appropriate that truth by your faith, you will never, ever be the same again. Trust God and give your life to God. It will be the greatest turning point in your human existence, and you can do it, and you can have it right now, if you will. Then write to us, will you? At the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, there's a reason for your life. And haven't you always felt it? Haven't you always really known it inside? There's a reason for your existence. God has a will for you. I've written free literature on the spiritual life, on these very things, yours without cost, charge, or obligation, when you write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, The Fatherhood of God, The Brotherhood of Man, Life After Death, What Happens to You When You Die, What Lies Beyond, all of this, yours with no cost, charge, or obligation when you write to us. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell that mailing address, Box 3080 Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program. Program, proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.